This is an 8-pin plotter, the kind of fancy output device that's usually part of an expensive computer-aided design or CAD system. Now, professional CAD systems can cost $20,000 or more, but with the increasing speed and memory of personal computers, you can now get personal CAD programs for as little as $100. Today, we take a look at personal CAD software on this edition of the Computer Chronicles. The Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by CompuServe, featuring an online reference library, Wall Street reports, at-home shopping, airline reservations, games, and hundreds of other services. CompuServe, helping people get the most from computers. Additional funding is provided by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Byte. Byte's detailed technical articles on new hardware, software, and languages cover developments in computer technology worldwide. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffe, and sitting in this week for Gary Kildall is Jan Lewis. Jan, we have a neat little program up here. It's kind of a CAD program for kids called Car Builder. Watch what you can do. I'm right now designing or redesigning the body of this car. You can see I can move that cursor there. I can kind of push down that little bump in the hood if I want. Say I was uh -huh. happy with that particular body design. We can go in and test this car now and run it through a wind tunnel. Uh, we'll go into the main menu over here. And you'll see I've called this hyper car, by the way, in honor of your <laughs> magazine. Uh, let's go into test cars. And one of the choices I have, as I say, is I can take it on a road test or I can run it through wind tunnel tests. Uh, and we'll see what the engineers tell me as I run this through the wind tunnel test. And you can see the wind actually coming you across actually the car. See that. There it is. And my guess is that car is not going to do too well. <laughs> I rather car would use some much more work to decrease the drag. No kidding. Uh, this is a very simple example of a CAD program. Uh, That's wonderful. Obviously, package. Jen. We're talking about personal CAD in this program, and I'm wondering how you would define that. How is that more than just a draw program, and why is it less than a full-blown CAD CAM program? Uh, if you look at what full-blown full CAD CAM programs are doing, let's say if you look at General Motors or a big car company, what they would be doing with a car, they have a great deal of intricacy. Uh, they need to do a lot more permutations and manipulations, mm -hmm. and they need to do it very, very fast. Uh, what personal CAD has done is taken the same types of things that they do in the professional CAD areas and brought it down to the level that individuals can do it, mm -hmm. uh, not with as much intricacy. Or in the case of this, even on an Apple II, that a kid can sit down and mm -hmm. actually do uh, CAD CAM, basically. And, and why is it more than just a draw program? Uh, CAD is uh, designed for objects and the manipulation of objects through various conditions. Mm -hmm. uh, the draw program uh, is designed for a static uh, production. As well with the CAD programs, you need to have access over every one of these little bits, the way you yeah, were doing yeah. a few minutes ago. And draw programs, you don't need that. Okay, Jan, we're going to take a look at five of the most interesting personal CAD programs in the MS-DOS world. We'll take a look at generic CAD, fast CAD, and AutoCAD. We'll see two programs for the Mac 2, the Mac version of VersaCAD, and a new 3D CAD program called Dimensions. We start out by drooling over one of those very expensive CAD programs that's used at a very large design company, Bechtel Corporation, right here in San Francisco. This space station, this subway station, and this amusement park ride don't really exist yet, except in the memory of this computer. But common to all of these designs is a level of detail and realism that makes it possible to build a factory, a power plant, or transit system entirely in digital form before committing it to construction. The software that makes it possible is a combination of packages developed by the Bechtel Group. 3DM is a three-dimensional modeling system that permits an engineering team to design and view a project in layers from the outside structure to the individual elements inside. Since the program draws its data from the original schematic or logical design, it accurately represents each element or system and how they fit together. The program can also detect how changes in any one part of a system might affect another. The same digital data used to create the static model can be used to build an animated model as well, with a software package called Walkthrough. Walkthrough permits an engineer to examine a solid model of the project, to move individual parts, 
and to inspect the premises in real time like a tiny human model. 3DM and Walkthrough have all but replaced blueprints at Bechtel. Most importantly, the software establishes a common design database that every project member can rely on and contribute to. Joining us in the studio now is Bob Fulton, President and CEO of Generic Software of Redmond, Washington. And next to Bob is Mike Riddle, President of Evolution Computing of Tempe, Arizona. Jen? Mike, it seems as though there's been a proliferation of CAD packages, particularly in the last year or so, which is about the length of time that FastCAD has been out. Why is this? Is this the faster processors, more memory? What's the reason for this? Um, both of those reasons. Uh, the hardware has improved quite a bit. The cost has come down. Uh, quite a few more people can afford the performance necessary so that people are now able to try doing both graphics and word processing together on a computer. Bob, we've heard of CAD programs costing thousands of dollars. You've got generic CAD, which I think sells for about 99 bucks, and yet that's quite a bit. Could you demo generic CAD for us? Yeah, I sure can. First thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to draw a floor plan. I think this is a uh, using double walls, and this is a very common type of use of CAD. So we'd be using CAD here to really lay out a house design of some sort. That's correct. Mm -hmm. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to use what's called a macro command to complete that, which is to draw the interior walls. Uh, and this is set to the, uh, to the outside dimensions I put in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to come down, I'm going to go back to the menu, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to put in some bathroom and kitchen fixtures. First of all, let's take a look at them. This is called a preview. Now, I've only got a very few there. Uh, this could be uh, hundreds or dozens of different fixtures. I'm going to come back to the first floor. And what we're going to do, first of all, you notice they're all facing down. I'm going to pick a shower, first of all. And you'll see it in a shadow there. I'm going to bring it up. Could you have created those fixtures in, in the CAD program also, Bob? Yes, you can either create them or you can buy them okay. already made. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm not going to pick a toilet, and I'm going to turn that toilet to face to the left. Mm -hmm. I'm going to put it in there. I'm now going to pick a bathroom sink, which I'm going to turn to the right, and I'm going to put it into there. Hmm. And there I've got a bathroom. Now, Bob, what if I wanted, instead of the shower, let's say I wanted to have a bathtub? Okay, well, very easy. What you can do is a component replace. I just type in CN. Uh, the bathroom, the shower is AP4, and the bathtub is AP5. Mm -hmm and it automatically changes it out. Okay, now suppose it didn't fit hmm. that bathtub in the particular room you'd allocated for the bathroom. Uh, if it didn't fit, then uh, first of all, if you knew uh, that, uh, let's say if you'd already, it was your existing house, you'd know that it wouldn't fit. Right. Uh, if it was a new house or you decided you were gonna make some changes, you could move the wall. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, now, in order to complete the kitchen, I come back uh, down and I pick up the oven range, and I pull it up into place. I pick the uh, kitchen sink, got to have a kitchen sink into the counter, and decide I want a fridge, and I'm going to pick that and have that face left. And there's the kitchen mm -hmm. at this point with the basic appliances installed. So you can really kind of uh, a spreadsheet style what if, if you will, I mean experiment without actually moving the furniture around and seeing whether it fits and, and how it looks and so on. That's correct. It saves a lot of, uh, let's say, a lot of uh, strained backs and uh, <laughs> bruised fingers by not having to move those things around. You can try it out in advance. Bob, if I can ask you to slide the keyboard over to Mike so he can get FastCAD loaded up there in the computer and while he's doing that, who would be the typical user for something like generic CAD? Is it just a, a homeowner, or would it be a professional architect or designer? Well, there is no uh, typical user. That's the interesting thing. Uh, about 24% of our user base are architects and engineers. Mm -hmm. About 36% are the Fortune 1000 large corporations. But the other 40% are the intriguing part. They're realtors, they're policemen, they're firemen, uh, they're ladies who design quilts. Mm -hmm. uh, they're just about any uh, practical use you could think of. Okay, Mike, you have FastCAD up there now, and show us what you do with FastCAD and how it, uh, it is different from what we've just seen. Okay, this is the floor plan of the house I live in, and uh, as an example of something we actually did, we changed the, one of the bedrooms to make an office out of it. It was a little narrow, so we expanded it and moved the wall out uh, two feet. What we can do is frame that, pick out what we want to change, and essentially say we want to move it so that that wall comes out here. 
Mm -hmm. That made me a larger room for a workroom. And if I decided I didn't like that, it'd be very easy to go back and reverse the change, mm -hmm. try it both ways, see what we want. Okay, a little more detail on that type of an operation. And what are we loading up here? A drawing that has uh, just a simple little framed area. Okay. It might be a patio or a lawn, mm -hmm. and some dimensions on it, something to show the distances. Now, what we do is we make that same type of a change, which I call stretch. We stretch the shape of things. We pick out what we want to stretch. We tell it to do it, and then we tell it how we want to move it. So you want to move it from here mm -hmm. to there. Mm -hmm. And we find that we've now automatically corrected our dimensions and the cross hatching. This is a feature that's typically found only in my programs and more expensive types of programs. Could you, if you wanted to see that in, let's say, metric or some other measurement system, could you do that? Yeah, since these programs know the real world di uh, distances, it's a simple matter to tell it how we want it displayed. If we want it displayed in metric, or if we want it displayed in feet and inches. Mm -hmm. Very easy mm -hmm. change. Okay, give you an idea of the types of complexity uh, in drawings that you can uh, do. Here's a rendering of uh, a desert home that uh, was done by our staff artist. It was designed by uh, Talias, an architect. What we can do with this, if we want to see different views, we can change the windows on the screen and perhaps add details. Now, would a drawing like that be created in FastCAD, Mike? Yes. This is a two-dimensional perspective drawing. The perspective is drawn by the uh, more or less traditional manner. You can. Hmm. Okay. Uh, and could you could could you blow that up so we want to see it in the hole in the full screen or sure. So, again, this is where having real speed in a program makes wow. a big difference. That's fast. It is fast. Yeah. Okay, now Mike, this is a two-dimensional rendering. Uh, what about three dimensions in FastCAD? Okay, this is our current two-dimensional product. I'll give you a look at the three-dimensional product, which should be shipping any day. And as you do that, I want you, to, I want you to show me an example which explains why it matters that you can do something in 3D instead of 2D. Well, the real world around us is completely a three-dimensional world. It's what we work with. And when we try to draw it on paper as a two-dimensional rendering, we always run into problems. The more okay. that we have a program that works with it, the better we can see this. To illustrate this, here we have this teapot. These two views of this teapot look very similar. Well, if we tell it to remove the hidden surfaces to show us a little better view of it as a three-dimensional object. We can see that this one is a view of the teapot from above, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. whereas this other one that looked very similar, it turns out to be a view of the teapot mm -hmm. from below. Which you could only really see by looking at it in a three-dimensional view. Right. Mm -hmm. without, with only, without the hidden surface removal, you'd never know that. Mike, one of the whole points in FastCAD is that it is fast, obviously. And what is the real benefit of speed to the user other than getting something done faster? Well, a lot of people think it's getting a job done in six hours instead of eight. But the real benefit is that instead of taking 20 seconds for some change, it takes you three or four seconds. That means that you don't lose your train of thought. Mm. You'll try things you wouldn't try otherwise. You'll experiment a little bit. So you'll do a better job. So it's really speed affecting the creative process, just not, not right. the time it takes to do it. Mike and Bob, thank you very much. In just a minute, we're going to take a look at two CAD programs for the Macintosh. First of all, Wendy Woods has a report on a company that specializes in CAD programs, and they use one of them to run their own business, and that program is called AutoCAD. For those just getting into the business of computerizing their design and drafting, life can be very confusing. There's usually a good chunk of money to consider, in the area of thirty-five to fifty thousand dollars. And there are hundreds of combinations of hardware and software. Well, that's where InterCAD comes in. Called a value-added reseller, they put together a custom design package of hardware and software to fill a client's needs, whether those needs be to design a building, a widget, or even a printed circuit board. There are clients that do not have or have very limited uh, exposure to computers and are really engineers at heart and, and want to do a design job and, and concentrate on that. So we put this together and provide it so he doesn't have to become an expert in all the graphics, the plotters, digitizers, etc. Resellers are also called value added because they generally supply service and training, further minimizing the confusion a first-time CAD buyer can face. 
there's no indication that choosing a CAD system is going to get any easier. Within the next five years, there are expected to be a number of new factors, including the prevalence of networking, artificial intelligence features on programs, faster, cheaper, more powerful systems, even a new class of users, all of which means businesses such as InterCAD will have plenty to do well into the future. In Santa Clara, California, for the Computer Chronicles, I'm Wendy Woods. With us in the studio now is Nick Pavlovic. Nick is president of Visual Information Incorporated, and sitting next to Nick is John Segudo, marketing director with Versicad Corporation, which is part of the Prime Computer family. Jan? John, you've just taken the, your best-selling VersaCAD uh, package and basically rewritten it for uh, the Macintosh. Can you give us some insight as to why you uh, decided to go in that direction? Oh, yes. The Macintosh interface supports a variety of loyalties amongst the users, and that is because of the simplicity and ease of use. The uh, operator can learn the software quicker and therefore use it more effectively. It does require an entirely different uh, approach to doing uh, text-based applications as we've done in Unix and MS-DOS based solutions mm -hmm. because of its graphics mostly. Why did you rewrite the package instead of just porting over the old package? Well a port in our case wouldn't have been taking the best advantage of what is probably one of the most pressing problems with CAD packages which is to simplify it so more users can actually operate the programs. We find that uh, by taking the Macintosh interface and using our already easy to use software we've attracted a very strong following who really believe we're one of the most complete and easy to use CAD packages on the Macintosh. All right, Nick, we're going to give you your turn now. You've got, you've got a CAD program called Dimensions, which is pretty powerful. Why don't you show it off for us here on the Mac 2? Okay, Design in Solid Dimensions is basically a conceptual design and presentation system. And I want to show the uh, three basic application areas. Here we have a mechanical application of a connecting rod. And I want to show one of the main features of our software, which is the smooth shading and edges that you see along here. This was taken as part of a piston and I'll show the exploded parts of the piston and you can move these around put them back together I want to show a graphic display here we have some letters we generated with our, our ray tracing capability and ray tracing allows you to do these highlights shadows and also transparencies and multiple reflections using these fonts and 3D elements, mm -hmm. you can create presentations like this. Here we have 3D letters and 3D shapes. Going on in the architectural area, you can display the inside of an office and the outside mm -hmm. of the office. And this bu building here is actually displayed in wireframe mode. I'll take and make the image smaller, move it over here, center it so you can still see it and use it for reference. And I'll bring in a library. And the basic file of the wireframe. And what's missing in this wireframe from the solid is the palm trees. And I'll bring the library in, and I will not only go to full screen on the image, but I'll take and focus in on the center where the palm trees are supposed to go, mm -hmm. place the palm trees, and I deliberately left one of the palm trees out, this one right here, I go back to the library, take one palm tree, put it in correctly, go back to a full image, and place the palm tree out in the parking lot. Place one here, one here, and I'm going to create a big palm tree to, to show our scaling capability and set it right in the center and then go back to the multiple windows and demonstrate to you not only are the palm trees in the center but they're also in the parking lot with the small ones flanking the large one. 
-hmm. In addition mm -hmm. to this, we can do an animation which lets you look from all angles mm -hmm. what you've just designed. And it's at mm. this point that you can take your different views, transfer them directly through our binary interface to Versicad's package for final detailing and production drafting. Nick, if I can ask you to slide the mouse and the keyboard over to John so he can get Versicad up and running. And while he's doing that, I noticed in that animation in the lower right-hand window, it stopped when you used the mouse. What was the program doing there? We have many capabilities built into dimensions to enable the designer to work more quickly and efficiently. And one of them is to interrupt the animation. Another is to interrupt a refresh mm. to let uh, the designer choose a new command. And the third feature is the ability to turn groups off and only concentrate on those groups you wanted to design. And all of this enables things to respond more quickly to you. Yeah. Okay, John, let's take a look now at Versicad Macintosh. And you've got some interesting things here with HyperCard and so on. Show it to us. Yes, I brought up a screen that's very typical for an architectural application. Here we see an uh, architectural layout of a building, in this case a Macintosh type office. You'll notice as you look throughout the drawing, you'll see lots of little computers, desks, and lots of smaller parts of an entire building, which commonly presents an architect or a designer with a problem of tabulating or keeping mm -hmm. track of all this. As we go throughout the drawing, there's many ways of working with a given drawing. In this case, I'm simply going to take a door and see if two doors collide. So as I go into uh, the drawing and ask for the rotate command to use, notice that the door can be quickly seen and see mm. two doors will be bumping if I put yeah. it there. At any given time, I can escape out of my command, so anything you do, you can undo. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to realize that these symbols are all being tracked, and a very fundamental part of the software is that the entire palettes in the screen are able to be implemented and used just like people would move tools on their desk. Mm -hmm. Now in this case, I'm going to move over to the Versicad application on HyperCard, we call it HyperCAD, and we've written over half a dozen routines which are specifically designed to go into our VersaCAD drawing database and retrieve information, allowing you to spool drawings, allowing you to add text from your mm -hmm. word processor, or in this case, I'm going to show the bill of materials. You notice the master screen is all icons. HyperCard is a graphical database program where people can use icons rather than typing in commands. So in this case, I'll open the drawing. This is the Macintosh office. And once the drawing is open, HyperCard will now go out and count all the actual uh, symbols being used here. You'll notice that I have uh, different counts and different qualities of these symbols. Each of these are able to be edited. And as, I fin as this uh, software finishes adding in the particular attributes, we'll go in and total up the complete sum of the application. Mm -hmm. And I'll show you that report right here. Notice that in this report, it tracks for me automatically the so total sum cost like a good spreadsheet. In fact, it's directly compatible to be cut and paste to the Microsoft Excel type applications. We've written several programs that take a lot of advantage of the way HyperCard is written. So, that's your, so just to make clear what's going on, what you're doing there is the program is keeping track of all those symbols, elements, components you added in that design and showing you how many there were, what the cost would be, and so on and so forth. Absolutely mm -hmm. correct. We're okay. able to attach information Sometimes people like to edit, for instance. Uh, if I wanted to go back into a symbol and say, the size has now changed, or maybe a unit cost has gone up, mm -hmm. I can go and scroll through my options and then say, now the door has gone up another $10. So you could add, edit graphically or edit with the numbers there. Exactly. Uh, we just have a little bit of time. Show me the 3D feature of uh, VersaCAD Mac. Yes, VersaCAD has made very many commitments to 3D, and the Macintosh is certainly one of them. As I go into the drawing, you'll notice now that 3D will come up, and I'll be able to bring out the same office view I'm looking at from a top-down view. I'll be able to also ask the drawing to automatically light source shade it for me, so I can get many views at once. So as I open the drawing, we'll see the what they call a perspective view, where you see vanishing points, mm -hmm. as if you were a bird looking down on top of the building, with no roof in this case. Mm -hmm. As I ask the computer next to do a multi-view, I'll split the screen up to four separate windows. And then at that time, you'll see automatic colors be brought into it. Mm -hmm. This al allows me to draft in 2D and also bring it into 3D. The complement of both programs gives the operator the chance to use 
is choice of, of application. Okay, so in the lower left hand corner is that overhead view and there we see a 3D mm -hmm. perspective mm -hmm. in the upper left with the colors. We'll get a plan, an elevation, mm -hmm. and uh, side views all the way throughout this drawing automatically. John, that's great. John, Nick, thank you very much. And that's our look at personal CAD programs. Hope we'll see you here again next week on the Computer Chronicles. random access file this week, Apple has unveiled its long-awaited Macintosh Portable. It's touted to be a full-fledged Mac with no compromises. It comes complete with a trackball to provide a mouse-type interface. The screen is 50% larger than the Mac SE screen, with a resolution of 640 by 400 pixels. The Mac has a lead-acid rather than a nickel-cadmium battery, which means 6 to 12 hours on a charge, plus predictable full recharges at any time. It comes standard with a 1.4 megabyte floppy drive, and there is an optional 40 megabyte hard drive. With the hard drive, the Mac laptop weighs 16 pounds. The list price is $6,499. IBM says it's developing two new laptops, a battery-operated version of the P70 and a new pocket-sized laptop. And Pocket Computers last week released its mini laptop called the Pocket. It weighs one pound. It's an MS-DOS compatible with full-size screen and a 77 key QWERTY keyboard. The Pocket uses small RAM and ROM cards for storage and applications. The Pocket runs off two AA batteries for up to 100 hours. Price is $1,995. Atari has started shipping its mini laptop called the Portfolio. It has a smaller screen in the pocket, but comes with built-in word processing and spreadsheet software. It weighs one pound, runs on three AA batteries, and sells for $399. Philips has entered the PC market for the first time with a new desktop PC called the Explorer. It's IBM compatible but comes standard with a Mac-like icon interface. Peripherals snap in, no need to ever take the cover off. The uh, complete color system including monitor, mouse and built-in software is $999. Hewlett Packard is introducing a new low-cost laser printer, the LaserJet 2P. Retail price is only $1,495, about a third the price of the full-blown HP LaserJet. And HP's newly acquired Apollo division has just released a 68030-based Unix workstation for under $4,000. It's called the Apollo 2500, and it comes with built-in network support. VXM Technology says it will soon start shipping a software package that can transform a local area network into a parallel processing supercomputer. VXM says with its software, a 25-node network of Macs or PCs can deliver the processing power of an IBM 3090 mainframe and that a network of 25 RISC workstations could have the power of a Cray supercomputer. Apple and Microsoft are reportedly about to announce adoption of their own page description language called PM Script. The new standard will replace Apple's current use of Adobe's PostScript language. That's it for this week's Random Access. I'm Kate McGargy. The Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Byte Magazine, and VIX, the Byte Information Exchange. In print and online, Byte and VIX serve computer professionals worldwide with detailed information on new hardware, software, and technologies. For a transcript of this week's Computer Chronicles, send $4 to PTV Publications, Post Office Box 701, Kent, Ohio, 44240. Please indicate program date.